So, without further ado, Dr. Westerman, 1134, so I think we're going to get started. Uh, Dr. Westerman is a professor uh, at the University of Arkansas in the Department of Biological Sciences. She is an integrated animal behavioralist. Uh, it's her area of study. So today, uh, she uh, is going to present a program for us on uh, butterfly behavior and ecology. Uh, so without further ado, let's give Dr. Westerman a hand. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here and wonderful programs that you have these next few months. I, I may have to sign up for some of those trips to the prairies. I do like prairies quite a bit. We'll be talking a lot about local prairies today in my talk on a butterfly's perspective to our, uh, our gardens and our prairie ecosystems. Uh, I want to just quickly mention that while I have the Botanical Gardens of the Ozarks up on this board, that's because one of the projects that I talk about, I'm going to talk about today is a collaborative project with the Botanical Gardens of the Ozarks and the broad community of Northwestern Arkansas. And I will talk a little bit about how any of you and all of you can be involved in that research project if you would like to be. We like to, in my lab, we like to work with the community and we work with all ages of students from quite young to quite experienced. Butterflies are one of the most abundant and diverse types of pollinators that we have on the planet. When you combine butterflies with moths, you get the Lepidoptera, and there are more species of Lepidoptera than there are of any other group of animal except for the beetles. So this is an incredibly speciose group of animals. They come in a variety of different colors, in different sizes. They live in lots of different areas. And one of the questions that I and many other researchers who are particularly interested in butterflies ask is how do we get so many different butterflies? How do we get so many different species is a, is a question that interests many biologists. And for those of us who are particularly passionate about butterflies and pollinators, we're interested in how do we get so many different butterflies? And the flip side of this question, since these are pollinators, is how do you get so many different types of flowers? And not all of these are from my garden, but these are all pictures of plants that are either in my garden or in my greenhouse or in my house. I do have a Hoya. This is not a local flower, but it's such a cool flower, I wanted to include it here anyways. Uh, so how do we get so many different flowers? This is a question that has fascinated biologists for a really long time. And one of the things that people started doing uh, in, the, in the 19th and 20th century was look at which animals visited what different types of flowers. And they came up with these concepts called pollinator syndromes, which is a way of matching the plant to pollinator diversity. And it, they called them pollinator syndromes because there are characteristics of plants or of flowers that attract specific types of pollinators. For example, here you're looking at a picture of a dandelion, which is bright yellow, and you have a bunch of bees that are also yellow visiting this yellow flower. In contrast, here we have a lily that's being visited by a swallowtail. Now, these two types of pollinators are different. They're different in the way they look. They're also different in what they can see and what they can smell. And they're different in how big their mouth parts are that give them access to nectar in these food sources. And those differences have resulted in the flowers are trying to attract different types of pollinators getting different morphology different colors, different odors, different amounts of nectar, different amounts of pollen, and different lengths of tubes that contain nectar. Historically, butterflies were characterized as having one specific type of pollinator syndrome, which is in comparison to what you see in bees and what you get with moths and what you get with hummingbirds and mice and flies. 
However, butterflies aren't all the same. If we look at different butterflies, not only do we see their wings, so here you have a brown, this is the squinting bush brown butterfly, it's native to Africa. This is the postman longwing, it's native to Central and South America. And this is a cabbage white, which many of you may be familiar with, seeing your gardens. I see them all in my garden quite a bit. These three different butterfly species not only have different colors on their wings, but they also have different visual abilities. So these stained glass window like images that you're looking at are actually photographs of their eyes. These photographs are taken by taking advantage of the fact that these butterflies have a membrane in the back of their eye that reflects light back out to be captured by uh, photoreceptors in their eyes. So just like if you see a deer in your headlights, you get a, a shine from their eyes. We call that an eye shine. We get the same thing with butterflies. If you shine light on a butterfly's eye, you're going to get colors back. If we focus on that part of the eye, we see the colors of what we call filtering pigments in the eyes that filter out different wavelengths of light. So what you're seeing here are these little squares are the different components of the compound eye, the ones that are yellow. They're getting lots of yellow light. The ones that are red, are getting lots of red light. So if we look at this butterfly, this butterfly can see a lot of yellow relative to the amount of red that they can see. When we compare to what you see in, in this long wing butterfly, it's kind of a nice mix of yellow and red. And when we look at the cabbage white, you see it's almost completely, just a little teeny tiny bit of yellow. So these three species of butterflies not only look different, but they don't see the same things. So one of our hypotheses was that maybe since they don't see the same things, they might not be attracted to the same flowers. Question, and to get a sense of what's going on in terms of our butterfly community here in Northwestern Arkansas, we go out into the field and we observe lots of butterfly behavior, we look at flowers, and we also use tools to capture the amount of light that we have in our environment. So these are two members of my research group and they're recording the amount of light that we have out at Woolsey Wet Prairie. Uh, we collect light uh, and this is gonna tell us how much light there is, so whether it's a cloudy day or a sunny day. It also tells us how much of different types of light there are. Is there a lot of ultraviolet light? Is there a lot of red light or is there a lot of green light in the, the light that we're getting from the sun? And we check this throughout the year as well as at different times of day. I mentioned that I'm an integrative animal behaviorist. So what that means is that I'm not just interested in what's going on in terms of butterfly vision and their choices. I'm trying, I'm interested in how we figure out how they make those variation in the eye. So how do you get this variation in vision and how do you get this variation in color? And how do you get variation in behavior? So in my research group, we start out by dealing with the genome of an animal. And then we look at their developmental environment, both the physical environment, so the amount of shade, the amount of food that the animals have access to, as well as the social environment that they're in. So how many other caterpillars are in their environment? How many adults are in their environment? To see how these three factors, their genetics, their physical environment, and social environment, influence the sensory system, so the brain and the visual abilities of butterflies when they're adults. And then we look at how that adult sensory system interacts with a physical environment and social environment at a given moment in time that influences the decisions that they make. So what actually influences the flower choices that they make when they're looking for food and the mating decisions that they make when they're looking for mates. And then to complete the circle, we look at how this affects 
future generations of butterflies to get an answer to the question of how do we get so many different butterflies. Now this cycle is a, that's a pretty complex cycle. And if I was talking about all of the different research that we're doing in my lab to work on all of these different elements, we would be here for a very long time. I've got some awesome graduate students and undergraduate students working in my lab, and they do very cool work. Today, I'm only going to be talking about our work with the physical environment, partially because this is a community that's particularly interested in native plants. And I wanted to talk a little bit about our work with native butterflies and the interactions between native butterflies and plants. So today, I'm going to talk about seasonal butterfly behavioral diversity in northwestern Arkansas. Then I'm going to move to a community project that looks at community butterfly behavioral diversity in northwestern Arkansas. If I have time, sometimes I talk fast, sometimes I talk slow. We'll see how it goes. If I have time, I'm going to move to some of our work looking at butterfly behavioral diversity on a global scale but all with a focus of looking at how the physical environment influences the way butterflies behave. So the first research question that I'm gonna talk about today is how ambient environmental conditions affect butterfly behavior. We're gonna look at this at the species level as well as the community level. So at the species level, does the behavior of the common buckeye change with the seasons? If so, how? And at the community level, are weather and butterfly colors predictive of butterfly behaviors? So when you go out into your garden, could you make a prediction about what butterflies you'd expect to see and what you'd expect those butterflies to be doing based on the weather conditions and the flower colors that you have in your garden? One of the reasons that we're interested in that here is because we are in a prairie environment and there's a lot of seasonal environmental change that occurs in our growing season. So this is just pictures of a, a, a prairie, local prairie. This is at the beginning of the season, bit nice lush green, uh, relatively easy to see a lot of the trees in the background. So the grass is relatively short at this point. This is in August. So the grasses are not only a different color, but they're also significantly taller. So the person taking the photograph stood in the exact same spot and they didn't magically shrink in this photograph. They're, they didn't get smaller, but you'll notice if you compare the tree lines, you can see a lot less of the trees in this picture than you can in this one. Um, our, hopefully with some of your uh, prairie field trips later this summer, you'll, you'll get the experience of being in some of our tall grass prairies, which are quite tall. So there's still environmental variation that ex are experienced in our prairies. And for a number of different species of butterflies, they actually change their wing patterns based on the seasons. So these are three different species of butterflies. These two butterflies are the same species. These two butterflies are the same species. They're just grown in different environmental conditions. So some seasonal forms can be very dramatically different in terms of color and patterning. And this helps the butterflies blend in to their different environments as the environment changes. So we have these variations in wing pattern, but many species also have variation in their behavior. So these are just two examples of butterflies. This is that squinting bush brown butterfly. Here we have one of our, uh, a, not our local cabbage white, but this is a, a Asian, uh, sorry, a Eurasian cabbage white. And these butterflies have different, acted to different colors on the season. These butterflies change which of the two sexes, whether it's the male or the female, that is most choosy. So in one season, the female is very particular about who she mates with. And in the other season, the male is very particular about who he mates with. So there can be seasonal variation, seasonal variation in behavior. One of our local 
butterflies, one of our most abundant butterflies, is the common buckeye. The common buckeye has two seasonal forms. This is the seasonal form we usually see during the summer. This is the rosa form. It's much darker in color. Every once in a while, we get both forms at the same time. So this is, this is not a staged photograph. This is from wet Woolsey, well, sorry, Woolsey Wet Prairie. So sometimes you can get both morphs at the same time, but usually we get this morph later in the year. So this is a native and abundant species. It's seasonally polyphenic. Their wing patterns, uh, you see when you're gonna get a dark form, that rosa form, when you would have the light form. Though primarily those studies have been conducted on the coasts. We have very little data on what's going on here in the middle of the country. And there's been a little bit of work looking at their behavior. We had a question, uh, and this is work primarily done by my graduate student, Grace Herzl. Our questions were, when does the change in wing color occur in Arkansas population? So we know about California populations. We know about North Carolina populations. But what's going on here? Okay. And do wild populations exhi exhibit seasonal differences in behavior? that might correspond to the variation in wing pattern. And then lastly, do any seasonal changes in behaviors correspond to that same changes in wing color? To do this, we uh, did a, a series of surveys over a three-year time period in three different prairies here in northwestern Arkansas. And at each site, we did behavioral watches to see what the butterflies were doing. And we took irradiance, so light measurements, and temperature measurements at these three sites to see if there's a relationship between temperature, light, and behavior and wing pattern of these butterflies. We recorded a wide range of different behaviors. So some of the behaviors that butterflies exhibit include flying, nectaring, basking, resting, slowly fluttering their wings, quickly fluttering their wings, chasing other butterflies. A number of species of butterflies are quite territorial. So you might see butterflies chase other butterflies outside of their territories uh, in your gardens. They might be courting, they might be mating, and they might be hovering, getting ready to oviposit eggs. Today I'm going to talk about four different behaviors, flying, nectaring, basking, and resting. Flying is kind of self-explanatory, so I don't have a picture of what flying looks like. Uh, but for nectaring, what we called nectaring was when a butterfly was actually visiting a flower and we could tell that they were taking, probably taking nectar out of that flower. Basking is what we call when butterflies sit with their wings open. And then resting is when they're sitting with their wings closed. You can see that this particular butterfly is, is it in a darker spot, so they're blending into the background a little bit better, they're a little bit in the shade relative to this nice basking buckeye who's out and potentially getting sun. So we had some weeks where we do it during surveys, taking in, getting information on their behavior. And then on other weeks, so the alternate weeks, we were collecting butterflies to score their wings to see how their wing pattern changes throughout the season. A number of studies have looked at the buckeye and have come up with a scoring scheme to score butterflies from being very light in color, so that would be a one, to very dark in color, which would be what we call a five. In the California and North Carolina populations, this change from a one to a five is related to changes in temperature when they're caterpillar. So we wanted to see if we got the same thing happening here in Arkansas. And we've been doing this we did this from 2018 through the summer of 2020. What we found was that our butterflies get the, have darker wings in September. That's when you see the, the big change in wing color. We start in the middle of September, and by October, almost all the butterflies that you see are going to be rosa. The, the lighter butterflies are caught at higher temperatures. So if we're just looking at a continuous changes in temperature, you do get ones. On most of the time, you get ones when it's very warm, and you start getting, getting fours and fives when it's colder. And if we plot the average weekly temperature on our, uh, our plot with the change in wing score, you can see that as temperatures drop, we get that nice rise in wing pattern. 
So here in Arkansas, we do get a change in wing color in the common buckeye. It occurs in September and it correlates with a dr pretty dramatic change in average weekly temperatures. Our next question was whether these butterflies also exhibit seasonal variation in behavior. So I'm going to again just talk about nectaring, flying, resting, and basking behavior today. So when we look at their nectaring behavior, we find that throughout the season, the butterflies actually nectar about the same amount of time. So they're feeding on average uh, uh, somewhere between 40 to 50 percent of the time that we're watching the butterflies, they're nectaring. So they spend a lot of time searching for food, independent of temperature and season. When we look at their flying behavior, we actually found a, a lot of flying happening in June and a fair amount of flying happening in October relative to the other months. And when we looked at resting, we found an effect of, of uh, time of year, but this was kind of a weird one. Something seems to be going on towards the end of August. We're not really quite sure what. We're still exploring this to figure out what we're, what's going on here. Uh, that doesn't match this change in wing pattern. However, when we look at rest, sorry, basking behavior, which is when butterflies sit out with their wings open, usually in a sunny spot that might allow them to soak up sun and get warmer, we found that our butterflies were starting to increase their basking behavior right at September. This corresponds to when you get that change in wing color and when you get the drop in temperature. So in our common buckeye population, uh, these butterflies are changing their behavior in a way that corresponds with their wing patterns in a way that may be adaptive and help them get warmer right when the temperatures start to cool. So while they do change their basking, resting, and flying behaviors, the variation in basking correlates really nicely with changes in wing patterns. So that's a little bit about at the species level, so looking at one particular species about how their behavior can change throughout the seasons. Now I want to talk a little bit about the community scale. Uh, are weathers and butterfly colors predictive of butterfly behavior? And before I move on to this project, I've gotten very used to giving people stretch breaks. Uh, in my classes, it helps. So we're going to take about 30 seconds, or if you have any questions that you want to ask, this is a great time to ask a question on the past project or anything about butterflies. Yeah, Eric. I might have mentioned I may have missed it. Uh, how long does, do those buckeyes, butterflies, stay spend in that caterpillar? Oh, that's an excellent question. So it depends on the temperature. So one of the projects that I'm not talking about, but that we're, we're running is looking at the effect of shade cover on caterpillar development and vision in the Buckeye. And when it's really hot, so July here in an open field, they go from being an egg to being a butterfly in about 21 days. So for, for a butterfly, that is a fast time. If it's a little bit cooler, it, take, it can take up to a week longer. So we do get a lot of variation in, in our population based on the ambient temperatures that they're experiencing. You're going to get differences in the amount of time that they're caterpillars. There may also be an effect of sex on that, but it, here the jury's still out. We don't have quite enough data yet to, con to say that, yes, there absolutely is a difference. But the temperature matters quite a bit. So the butterflies that are caterpillars now are going to be caterpillars for a longer period of time than the butterflies that are caterpillars in July and early August. And yeah. let's see, some butterflies, how long do they spend this way? That's highly variable per species. For the buckeye, it's I think it's about 10 to 14 days, but I, we've, we've done less, less work with, with those. For the butterflies that we rear in the lab, uh, so we work with primarily with African and the African butterfly that I showed you all and the uh, Central and South American butterfly in our butterfly facility. And for those two butterflies, the African butterflies, the males usually live on, on tops, tops 14 days. The females can live up to 
21 to 30 days. So the females live longer on average than the males do. Uh, that may be partially because males in most species, well, in all species of butterflies, males give females spermatophores during mating. And these spermatophores are not just sperm. They come often with a whole lot of nutrients. So in some species of butterflies, such as the cabbage weight, the males are giving, a, transferring a spermatophore that can be up to 30% of their body weight. And it takes a lot of energy to make those spermatophores. They're giving a lot of resources to the females. And mating, consequently, shortens their lifespan. The more spermatophores they make, the more spermatophores they pass on, tends to reduce their lifespan. Because while the, these species don't have parental care, they do put a lot of nutrients into their offspring. And it, both the males and the females contribute substantially. Yeah. Uh, all right. Any other questions before we move on to the community data? Those are great. All right. So the, one of our other big questions is like, so this is what's going on with one species, the common buckeye. But there is a lot more than one species here in Northwestern Arkansas. And in general, there are a lot of species of butterflies. We have a spectacularly rich butterfly community of more than 100 different species. When we go on our walks in, in Woolsey Wet Prairie, we often see 30 or more species that we can identify. And we know that there are more species of skippers than we're good at identifying on the wing. Right? Those skippers are really hard to ID when they're in flight. Uh, so we have a very rich butterfly community. And we wanted to see whether weather and butterfly color were predictive of butterfly behavior. So we, can we make any predictions about the ways butterflies behave in a community sense in our garden? One of the reasons we're interested in this because it, is that in addition to temperatures changing throughout the season and background color changing throughout the season, the light environment actually changes throughout the year. So this is work that Grace, my, my graduate student Grace did with an undergraduate, Ashlyn Anderson. And they were looking at the irradiance data that we collected when we went out to the garden, well, to enumerate these different prairies uh, over the last three years. And she's found that the uh, total amount of light we get changes throughout the year. And we have a lot of light in July, less light in September and, and uh, October. In addition, this, there, we have seasonal variation in prairie environments. And this combination and changes in background color and light, the amount of light that we're getting from the sun can produce some pretty dramatic changes in backgrounds that butterflies are going to be in. So these are just examples of four different pictures that I've taken at the botanical gardens from almost but not quite the exact same spot uh, in the winter, spring, summer, and fall. And there's a huge difference if you look at these four pictures in the color of the garden, but also the cloud cover and kind of the ambient light. So the, what you see changes. So given this variation in light and seasonal color, we were interested in whether butterfly color or weather may be predictive of butterfly behavior. And we asked a few different questions tied with this. First, does butterfly abundance change throughout the growing season here in Northwestern Arkansas? Is butterfly color predictive of butterfly behavior in general? The, can, could we say like, oh, a black butterfly is usually going to be sitting or it's usually going to be visiting purple flowers, while a yellow butterfly is usually going to be visiting red flowers, for example? And is light environment predictive of butterfly behavior? So does cloudy versus sunny skies influence what we see butterflies doing? And this is work that Grace has done with an undergraduate, or well, sorry, recent, recent graduate, Abby Merrill. And this work is published. So this is something that you all can access and was done in collaboration with the Botanical Gardens. So for this project, uh, we've been conducting surveys out at the Botanical Gardens and with my zoology class and my animal behavior class, now for the last five years. I'm gonna present data from the first four years today. Uh, and we do this in collaboration with visitors of the, to the garden, so anybody who visits BGO can participate in this study. There's also an opportunity to do this study in your home garden, so if that's something you're interested in, I'll show you how you can do that towards the end. 
This survey areas include the botanical gardens of the Ozarks, Wilson Park, and various Northwestern Arkansas locations. Since some of this work included the beginning of the pandemic when undergraduates were sent home, we actually also have data from across a large swath of the Southeast and Southwest of the US. The zoology and animal behavior students went on a 30 minute walk and recorded all of the, the butterflies that they saw while the BGO visitors were not given a specific time limit. And participants were instructed to fill out a data sheet. This is a little bit of what the data sheet looks like. So it, for every butterfly that you see, you record the color of the butterfly, the main color of the butterfly, the size of the butterfly, the activity, whether they're feeding, flying, or sitting. So here we didn't separate basking and resting. Those are combined for this study. And if they're on a flower or a plant, what the color of that flower or plant is. We also asked uh, students to record the latitude and longitude of their survey, what the weather was, whether it's sunny, partly cloudy, cloudy or rainy, the date that they were sampling, the time that they were sampling, and their age. Uh, I will say that children are very good at following directions. Adults are not as good at following directions. <laughs> so we learned a lot about the effects of age on following directions when we conducted this study. Uh, we didn't ask our participants to ID butterflies to species because we wanted to get as many people participating as possible and we didn't want any limiting factors. We are willing to, like anybody can write on what the species is if they want to, but it wasn't a requirement. Based on the colors that were circled and the sizes that were circled. So we, we have slight instructions in terms of size. So size would be uh, small was like pen pencil eraser size. So we're hoping we're getting our, our um, like Lysenid, so little blues. And then mediums is about a size of a key and lar or a watch face and large was anything bigger than a key. We didn't specify, and we didn't specify because I think the little butterflies are still going to be about a racer size, even if they've opened their wings. Uh, but you're right, we may have some, there's some variance there. Uh, but we didn't specify because we wanted it to be instructions that a five-year-old could process. Based on what was circled in terms of colors, we know we saw a lot of different species of butterflies, but we definitely have records for monarchs, painted ladies, red spotted purples, hackberry emperors, question marks, and common buckeyes. In addition to probably a lot of other species, but based on the colors we, that were circled and the sizes, we know we at least got these. We did also get a number of swallowtails based on the color and size combinations that were circled. To show you a little bit about what the, the data looked like, so with those latitude and longitude markers, uh, we have, if you look at Northwestern Arkansas, the black dots indicate all of the different places that people conducted the survey in Northwestern Arkansas, and we've starred the BGO and Wilson Park. And then because of the pandemic, and sometimes, you know, sometimes the students from zoology are Go, when I say you can go anywhere to take this survey, they go, oh, I can go anywhere. So sometimes they go anywhere. <laughs> so we get some surveys from some pretty interesting places. Uh, so here you can see that it's not just in Northwestern Arkansas. We do have data from a variety of different locations. And I'm first gonna show you the results in terms of butterfly abundancies. So over the first four years of this project, which is still ongoing, We've gotten data from over 4,000 butterflies. And we've had over 1,000 people participate in this project. Sometimes we get family groups participate. Sometimes we have individuals participate. But in addition to the, the students, which are collecting data during class, so they have very specific times where they're collecting. So animal behavior collects in, in April and zoology collects the last weekend of September, first weekend of October. BGO, we get throughout the year. 
So this is numbers of surveys that have been collected. And here you get the number of butterflies per sheet. So this gives us an approximation of when butterflies are most abundant in northwestern Arkansas. And you can see here that the times when we have the highest numbers of butterflies per sheet at the Botanical Gardens is August, September. So if you're like me and periodically get frustrated when you feel like there are no butterflies in June and, and it's so hot, so why aren't there butterflies yet? They're just not here yet. But give it, give it another month and a half, and then we'll have, we should be in peak butterflies time. So if you're looking for, for a good time to go looking for butterflies, uh, late August, early September, and into the beginning of October is a great time in Western Arkansas. Now I'm going to show you, when we break down this data, what happens when we look at those specific colors. So when we look at, at different colors of butterflies and see what they're doing, we find that different colored butterflies are exhibiting different behaviors. So these colors correspond to the main colors of the butterflies. So uh, black, blue, brown, orange, white, and yellow. And these are the act three activities that we have, feeding, flying, and sitting. And we've split up the BGO and, and uh, college student data because the assignments were a little bit different. But for both of these, you can see that we most often see the yellow butterflies when they're flying. And we get a lot more brown butterflies sitting in the zoology and animal behavior and we have a lot more brown butterflies feeding in the BGO data. But we have, very, relatively speaking, we have fewer butter, brown butterflies flying across both of our data sets. We, and but this is what I meant by uh, students are better than adults at collecting data. Because when we asked for primary colors of a butterfly, children circled the primary color of the butterfly. Adults usually circled multiple colors. So then we'd have to go in and look, match the, the multiple colors, think about what butterfly could have those colors, and then approximate what the main color really should be. So there's some approximation in here, but the same person did all of that approximating, so it should be cons relatively consistent. And we didn't do any of the analyses until after all of the butterflies had been given a primary color. We also found that these butterflies prefer different flower colors. So now the colors here correspond to flower colors. And black, blue, brown, orange, white, and yellow are the butterfly colors across the bottom. And the main thing I want you to take away from these images is that these rows, sorry, these columns are not identical all the way. So that means that we are finding some butterflies on some colors more often than others. And it's not the same for all butterflies. Uh, that's the kind of easiest way to read this output. If you wanted to think about specifics, one thing could you say that we usually found white butterflies on green plants or green flowers, so maybe on clovers. And we often found brown butterflies on yellow plants or at, at the botanical gardens on yellow plants. And another one is here, we've got a lot of orange butterflies for zoology on yellow plants. And here uh, at the BGO, we usually found those orange butterflies on pink and, pink and purple plants. So the butterflies prefer different flower colors. So one of my main takeaways from this is that if you want to have a diverse set of butterflies visiting your garden, plant a diverse set of colored flowers and you'll get a higher diversity of butterflies visiting. Cloud cover also influences butterfly behavior. So this is data that, that we only asked the college students about cloud cover. We're adding this cloud cover question to the BGO data collection based on these results. But when we look at cloud cover, we do see that different butterflies, different colored butterflies, are found in different cloudy conditions. So we had many more proportionally brown butterflies on cloudy days than we did on sunny days relative to the other colors of butterflies. When we look at the behavior that butterflies are exhibiting, on cloudy days, we're much more likely to find them feeding. 
And when we look at the flowers that they are on, we also found that on sunny days, we were much more likely to find them on green plants. And on cloudy days, we were more likely to find butterflies on yellow. So the takeaway from this study is that weather does seem to influence butterfly behavior. So weather in influences what butterflies are doing. The amount of cloud cover influences what you might be able to expect butterflies to do and what flowers you might expect to see them on. In addition, there is variation in flower preference within the butterfly community. Given this information, this is my one interactive question for, for you. Uh, given that information, do you think that these three species of butterflies that have different wing colors and different vision, do you think that these butterflies would be attracted to the same colored flowers? Uh, hands up if you think yes. Hands up if you think no. Yeah. Hands up if you're not sure. <laughs> also a good option. Uh, yeah, so one of the things that we're doing now is, is preparing to look at the eyes of butterflies that have different flower preferences to see if their eyes are different to see and to kind of complete this circle to see if wing pattern, not it only predicts uh, flower preference, but that flower preference seems to is tied or is not tied to differences in visual ability. But one thing that I would like all of you to take away from this is that ecosystems are not static and they're not communities of like just species, they're communities of individuals. And there can be variation in, in individuals and they're experiencing, to get this diversity of flowers, you have to have a diversity of pollinators that are gonna wanna visit this diversity of colors. And the environment that different species or individuals are in during development and throughout their lives might influence the way they behave. So when we look at species and we look at variation in pattern, whether it's variation in butterflies or variation in the happy faces on the abdomens of these happy face spiders, this variation is partially driven by the variation in the environment that they experience. So a few take home points from the last four years of this data is that working together, we can gather really large amounts of data. A thousand people going on 30 minute walks or less provides us with behavioral data for over 4,000 animals. That's a pretty impressive data set. Flower color diversity will increase butterfly diversity in your garden. July through September is peak butterfly time for Northwestern Arkansas. And weather, whether it's current weather, seasonal weather, or annual weather, may influence butterfly abundance behavior. And while, while there are a number of different classes that, that I'm sure uh, the wild ones have pollinator discussion, like pollinator plant classes or, or packets that I'm sure you all talk about, um, and I know BGO also has some specific butterfly plants, but I always encourage a diversity of colors because I like to have as many different butterflies as possible. And to do that, you have to plant butterflies, well, plant plants that are going to attract a diverse set of butterflies. So you need diversity in colors. And uh, one of my personal tips that I like to share, because I like getting lots of pollinators in the spring, is I always plant a few cabbages or Brussels sprouts for sulfurs. And those are just my like caterpillar plants. Because butterflies, it's only part of the life cycle. If you don't have food for caterpillars, you're not going to have any butterflies. Uh, so I always plant some things that are just for caterpillars. And I always let some of my Brussels sprouts and cabbages bolt because that's, and I, I probably don't need to tell you all that, but I, I think it's so cool to see all of the pollinators that get brought in by those bolting uh, Brussels sprouts and cabbages in the spring. And then those pollinators keep coming back and they pollinate everything else in the garden. So that's one of my tips when it comes to, to plants and getting more pollinators. 
Some of the things we're working on now that lead off of this is to see if there's any interactive effects between weather on our seasonal data. So uh, is this seasonal variation just due to the background color or does it also have to do with changes in weather? Does a big storm in the spring mean more than a big storm in the summer, for example? And how do annual weather patterns influence butterfly behavior and abundance? For example, does the spring that we had this year, which was kind of cold and very, very rainy, how does that influence what we get in the summer? So we are continuing to collect survey data uh, for the foreseeable future to get to a point where we can get like 10 years of data and then we can start really teasing apart the effect of seasonal patterns and annual patterns. We're also interested in how extreme weather events such as freezes, floods, and droughts influence butterfly abundance and behavior. And specifically whether shade cover influences butterfly behavior. If any of you are interested in participating in this project, we have a garden activity that's still ongoing at the botanical garden where you can either pick up paper copies of the sheets or there's a big board that has this QR code that is attached to an electronic version that you can do on your smartphone. If you are interested in collecting data at home, we also have an at-home collection form, which you can access by going to this website. So it's the BGO Butterfly Info 2. There's a garden data collection form. There's also an at-home collection form. Record data for your home garden. And this, I, I collect this data. Uh, you can either manually put in your latitude and longitude, or you can let the app see where your location is. Both work just fine. We can get, you can manually enter latitude and longitude or, or uh, give it to us. Or if you can, not, you can decide not to give it to us and then we just won't get to have a nice data point on our map as to where you are when we're saying where the butterflies are from. We'll just have it as our community data. But we uh, like getting data from all locations, not just the BGO. So, and and you, it, it's this same basic form where for every butterfly you see on a given day at time, what the color of the butterfly is, what the size of the, butter, the butterfly is doing, and then if they're on a plant, what is the color of that plant? And I think the online version, it's pretty hard to collect multiple, to, to circle multiple things. <laughs> yeah? Y'all ever look at iNaturalist data? We haven't started tapping into that data, but I have a number of colleagues at other institutions that have, have started using iNaturalist data. Okay. Yeah, it's a very powerful resource. For sure. How many pictures out there, we usually, you know, we take a picture of butterflies own something. Um, sometimes that's a flower, sometimes not. Yes. Just another resource to use. Absolutely. That's a great suggestion. Yes. Um, my, day, my yard is very, very shady. Uh huh. And you mentioned just you know, shade of yards. Yeah. Do they find plants that maybe kind of try and bloom in the shade? Are they, is there something I could be doing to make them come? Ah. Uh, uh, there are, so there are some butterflies that actually really only like to mate in the shade. So there are some butterflies who are going to find your garden particularly attractive. Uh, I, cabbage whites are, are very partial to doing some of their behaviors only in the shade. Uh, so cabbage whites, I don't know how easy it would be, like, other than the cap, the, there's the oviposition plants that they like, but also anything that has nectar and that is going to give you some, uh, they really like purples and reds. So there are certainly some shade. Yeah. Uh -huh. Could I add that um, they're on the uh, Wildwood website, there is a list of nature plants growing in growing shade, and maybe you can add some more flowers. Yeah, I live in the woods where there's tons of shade, and I am constantly trying to bring more flowers into the shade so that I can know more butterflies. Okay. I will do that. And 
there's a list on that website called Ready to Claim Membership. I have to point out that Lisa created that list. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's got several lists uh, that are on our website. I think uh, one of them recently has been turned into a database uh, or like a, micro, a Google Sheets sort of thing that you can search and organize and sort uh, the plan is on. That's the Pam over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one more tech than I am. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm also definitely still learning what the local plants are. I've been here for five years, but there are people who have been here for much longer than I have that know more about the plants. So I'm coming at this from the butterfly perspective. And I know there are a number of butterflies, though, that if you plant plants that they like the smell of and the color of, they will come to find those plants. And there are a number of species that, that have ultraviolet in their wings. And ultraviolet is, there's a higher percentage of ultraviolet light in shady environments because shade filters out long wavelengths of light. So ultraviolet signals are easier for butterflies to see in shade. So when butterflies who use ultraviolet are trying to find a mate, they prefer to go to shady locations. So I would th think that plants that had ultraviolet as part of their flowers might be plants that would also attract those types of butterflies. And because that, that, that UV is gonna be easier for them to see. Uh, my guess is that probably some of the plants that are shade plants that are native plants have a number of those colors, like some of my hostas have kind of white flowers, right? So that white probably has some ultraviolet in it and is gonna pull in pollinators that like those colors. So, but I haven't tested this hypothesis. It actually, it's part of a grant I'm writing though. So I might be able to answer your question much more specifically in about three years. <laughs> uh, in the back, and then I'll come up front. Um, so, and I apologize if you've already mentioned that, but I know that uh, birds do see different light spectrums, and so that can be um, an attractor, uh, like you were just talking about. So, do, do butterflies see a different visual spectrum uh, than? So yes, butterflies, but most butterflies can see an ultraviolet. They do have different visual spectrums than we do. Uh, most butterflies see ultraviolet and then also long, short wavelengths and long wavelengths. So they, the average species of butterfly can see all, the, all of those. Most have four photoreceptors instead of three. So we make our color vision and our rainbow is based on three photoreceptors. Most species of butterflies have at least four. So their rainbow looks a little bit different. Some of them have five. And then the filtering pigments that I've been showing you, and just a reminder, filtering, filtering pigments give us the colors that we see here. Those filtering pigments can combine with the different photoreceptors that they have to kind of give even a more diverse set of colors that they can see. So they can see a wide range of colors and we're still kind of trying to figure out everything that they see, but they definitely on average see a more diverse color set than birds do. Uh, in terms of sensory modalities, they actually do use a lot of different sensory modalities, that, but vision is their primary sensory modality. So the app, this is a butterfly brain. So antennae, central brain and all here you've got the eye on the outside but all of this is brain that is for processing visual information so for the average butterfly two-thirds of their brain is devoted to processing visual information 
So they are definitely primarily visual signalers. That being said, chemical signals matter too. So one example of this is, is actually uh, what this slide is tied to, uh, which is some of the oops, other work that I do, which combines visual signaling with olfactory signaling to see how, how butterflies integrate those two different types of signals. And because of that work, we've learned that if, if the butterflies use the olfactory cues that they're experiencing, which in this case, let's say it's a positive olfactory cue, so positive odor, positive pheromone of a male, they, can, they use that cue to tell them whether the visual cue that they're seeing is for a conspecific or not. So in this particular condition, we'd be looking at a female who's experiencing a fabulous odor, and they're learning to pair this odor with what would innately be a eh visual cue, but if they pair that eh visual cue with a great odor, in later trials, later mate choice assays, they think this visual cue is pretty great. <laughs> However, if you have a eh cue, visual cue, with a not so great olfactory cue, they don't like that in later assays. And if you pair a really hot visual cue with a negative cue, olfactory cue when they're young, they learn to avoid that visual cue. Mm -hmm. So there is an interaction between the olfactory cues and the visual cues that the butterflies use when they're making their decisions. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this influences their uh, nectaring site choice because that specifically has not been tested. But I can tell you that the interaction between the olfactory cue and the visual cue and the what positive versus negativeness of that is like very important and excuse me weighted kind of interestingly for mating decisions. They, so, yes. <laughs> so these are really good. I'm going to answer. I'll, so, so a little bit more about butterfly sensory modalities. Uh, and then I know you have a question up front. So then we'll, we'll come to this one. Uh, in addition to having an excellent, excellent vision, I mean, they're definitely primarily visual animals. They have great chemosensory abilities. And they have a lot of mechanosensory hairs along their legs. And the neat thing about hearing is hearing is, uh, is really just mechanosensory hairs. For us, we have our mechanosensory ears, hairs in our ears. We don't use our entire body to hear. A lot of insects have mechanosensory hairs kind of all over their bodies that help them sense vibrations and sound. So in a sense, you, you could possibly Think about like fruit flies, for example, hearing. So in fruit flies, the males do a wing vibration song, and essentially the females hear that with their entire body. That being said, there are a number of butterfly species that have a tympanic membrane that's essentially an ear, more like what we would think of as a, a membrane that vibrates and is an ear. And one of the species that I work with, this, this is one of my drawings of that bicyclist sunny nana, that squinting bush round. These butterflies do have a tympanic membrane. So they do have, in addition to have mechanosensory hairs along their body, they do have ears. This species of butterfly, Heliconius malpomini, may or may not have tympanic membranes. However, some of the work in our lab shows that they do respond to bird calls. So they do seem to be hearing, and it's unclear right now whether that is due to a tympanic membrane or is that due to some other way that they are hearing those vibrations. Because remember, they have hairs that are mechanosensory all over their bodies that could potentially, it's definitely on their, their legs, that could potentially let them hear sound. Does that answer your questions concerning sensory modalities? If, if there is <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right. And what was your question? Choose plants based on the coast plants. Mm. Because what I found is late April, early May in my yard, because at night, milkweed was only about this big. I had eggs all over it. And what I understand, so did a whole lot of other people in the community. So, I don't know. There's no flowers. There's, uh, there's berries. Yeah. It's almost only dirt. <laughs> yeah. Except I checking out, but there were eggs all over my for a lot of species of butterflies and Lepidoptera, um, there are there are innate behaviors and there are learned behaviors. And sometimes innate behaviors can also be learned. So it's a little the, the it's a little fuzzy on what we whether we should necessarily separate those two. But in many species, the plant that they are ovipositing on, uh, whether it's odor or visual cues in a number of species of butterflies, it's probably a mix of those two, odor and visual cues that they're looking for. Uh, and that appears to be pretty strongly ingrained. And like, this is what I'm supposed to look for. This is what I'm gonna lay my eggs on. If they are given lots of options, if there's a really nice tall plant versus a less tall plant, they'd probably pr prefer laying on the nice one, but those caterpillars can only eat milkweed. So since they eat milkweed, it would be maladaptive for the females to lay their eggs on something that's not milkweed, even though a whole lot of those eggs may not make it. There are, however, a number of studies looking at whether larval plant influences what adult butterflies then lay their eggs on. And in some species, but not all, and this hasn't been tested in a lot of species. It's been tested in some species. And remember that the Lepidoptera are the second most speciose group of animals on the planet. So I'm generally pretty hesitant in saying that anything applies to all, right? So if we've tested it in a few, we can say that it happens in a few. We don't know if it happens in everybody, uh, and, well, in all species. But there are some species of Lepidoptera that if you change the plant or the chemical composition of the plant that the caterpillars are reared on, the females, when they emerge, will then go look for plants that are similar to what they've been reared on when they are ovipositing. So some of that seems to be learned, and there, there may be uh, some amount of plasticity in what butterflies are gonna oviposit on. Uh, also, if you put them in a choice scenario where there are a range of plants based on what they're given a choice of, they may pick different things. They might weigh those options differently based on what the options are. Uh, but I don't know how, like, there have been some interesting studies looking at different types of milkweed and what the females like to lay their eggs on based on which, and, and how that relates to which of those milkweed are, are best for the caterpillars. That's kind of counterintuitive at this point. So we'll see if, if those things change over time due to selection. Yeah. Yeah. We had an we had a weird year this year with the like the you know the monarch migration happened pretty early, but we didn't you know we had a, this late spring and we didn't get a lot of good uh, of, of good plants coming up yet. So we may have lost some of that yeah, monarch crop. Yeah. Mm, yes. Can you uh, differentiate the difference between protein and phenotype expression versus protein from genetics? I will. I, I wish I had some. I don't have all my visuals for that here, but I, I actually I will do my best. Can you explain the question? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so. So uh, this is why I wish I have, a, I actually have a graphic that explains this, but I didn't put it into this talk. So uh, let's, if we're going from genome, so you start out with DNA. At some point, you're gonna get a butterfly. There's a whole lot of processes though that, can, that take you from here to here. And when you have genetic sequence, 
that gene sequence, if it's going to be transcribed, so that's the making of the protein. In the step to make a protein, you unwind the DNA, and the first thing you do is you make an RNA version of that DNA. And that RNA transcript is then going to have some chunks cut out of it because the RNA transcript includes all of the protein coding stuff and all of the non-protein coding stuff. So in this process of transcription, the first thing you do is usually cut out the things that you're going to put together to make the protein. So uh, there, you, can make, you can put different things together. So a single gene can make multiple proteins. It's not a one-to-one -one thing. So a single gene sequence can make multiple proteins. So that step of producing the RNA, that's going to give you, uh, if we're looking at sequence variation and we're looking at transcription in the brain of a butterfly, for example, that you're going to get this transcription, this transcript, like, oh, this is RNA. This is what could be made into protein. The, tr the next step is going from that RNA to protein. And so you to actually put the amino acids together. And that is, would be what we'd have as your protein, your proteomics. So if we're looking at an animal and saying, all right, what's going on in the brain, for example, of a butterfly, um, if I'm just looking at genes and transcripts, what you're looking at here are, is the transcript. So this is RNA, differences in RNA of a couple different genes in the brains of butterflies. This is the intermediate step between the gene sequence and the proteins that are going to be produced. Okay. So this is one step that you can look at. And then, then you're going to get a proteome, which is going to be the actual proteins that you get. And then uh, an, another connective piece is how do you go from that pro those proteins that you get to any behavior that you actually see? So what's the connection between genetic variation and behavioral variation? Or genetic variation and morpho morphological variation? And this is actually the, one of the main things that we work on in my lab. And that's why I was saying I wish I had my, that particular figure here, because I do have a fig figure that connects all the dots. Uh, but it's a pretty complex thing to go from the gene sequence to the behavioral variation, usually because uh, it's not just one gene that influences variation in behavior. So if you're looking at, at this, each row is a different gene. And each of these, and, and this is one social scenario, and this is a different social scenario. So what you're looking at here are a bunch of genes that are differentially expressed associated with one, one behavior. Uh, it's not just one gene. In this particular, it's eight genes. So this is a very specific situation where we've got eight genes that are differentially expressed that seem to associate with some behavior. So when you're trying to go from genetic variation to behavioral variation, it's, it's not a simple one-to-one -one path. So we do this a, a number of complex studies to look at what is the difference in sequence variation, which corresponds to, to potentially some difference in expression variation, so which genes are differentially expressed. And then we look at which of these genes influence what behaviors. Uh, and we can do that by doing CRISPR knockdown. Uh, we also make gene networks to see which genes are co-expressed. Uh, and I don't have those figures with me either, but I do have them. <laughs> so one of the other things that we do is we say, okay, we've got this gene that's differentially expressed, and we've got this gene over here, and, and uh, do, are they ever expressed at the same time? So are there networks of genes that might be highly associated with, say, flower selection? Like what's going on in the brain of a butterfly when she's picking a flower or picking a place to oviposit? And if we're trying to figure that out, we would look at like, wh what's going on in the brain in terms of genes. Are there different genes expressed or different gene networks that are associated with a particular flower, like a decision making, or when they're, they're with a, a brown, uh, not a, brown, a white flower versus a purple flower? 
And we could also look at hormones. So they have, just like we have dopamine and uh, serotonin and melanin and hormones that influence the way we behave. Butterflies also have most of those exact same hormones plus a couple other ones that, they, that influence their decision-making. And we can look at hormone levels in the brains of the butterflies too to see if, you're, if like, the hormones that are associated with positive associations or the neurotransmitters that are associated with positive associations, are those neurotransmitters more abundant or are genes associated with those neurotransmitters more abundant during the, the selection of a, a flower selection or the avoidance of some other flower? And most of the work that we're doing right now in the lab that's tied to that is with mate choice, because that's a lot easier for us to control in a choice setting than flowers, because flowers, you have, to, you have to have the right color and the nectar source. There are a lot of things that we have to control. And, and we just have, in, in my lab, we have more experience with that, with mate choice. But we are doing that, actually, with, with mate choice. Mm -hmm. Did you, did that help? Uh, we can talk about it. Okay. <laughs> so this is a practical question about caterpillars. So uh -huh. if she has monarch caterpillars and they eat up all the food on that plant, yeah. and she moves that caterpillar, does she need to move it to the same species that that caterpillar has been eating, or can she switch from common milkweed over to swamp milkweed? I have not run that experience with experiment with monarchs. I've run it with other butterflies. Though, and yeah. I, yeah. And what about the other butterflies? I went and bought milkweed. Yeah. I did I was inside and it was a cultivar of the Did it work? Milkweed, which was the same thing as the way it had gone. Yeah. It kept eating. It kept eating and I gave five of the caterpillars to tea and they, she said they all came out beautifully and even sent me pictures. Excellent. So for, for for some for some species, so some of the heliconi, uh, some of the long wing butterflies that I work with, uh, they some species won't eat a different type. So in our in our greenhouse, we have a lot of different types of vines for that particular species of butterfly. And if we rear a caterpillar for some of those subspecies, if we rear a caterpillar on one of those vine types, we better give that caterpillar another vine of that exact same lineage, otherwise it will stop eating. I wonder, but well, here's another example, so, and very practical for people who like tomatoes, the tomato hornworm will defoliate your tomato uh, plants, but I have read that tomato hornworms will also eat Nicotiana, which is an mm. annual flower, if you move that hornworm from the tomato over to the Nicotiana flower plant, will it eat that Nicotiana? Oh. <laughs> I, you don't know. I, I, yeah. It, it, it's uh, my guess is you know like I want to do the experiment. Yeah. I <laughs> I've just gotten very. Uh, I, I don't like making assumptions based on uh, one particular species to pass it because I've just. Heliconius sidnosa generalist. Well, Heliconius melpomene is a specialist. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you had a question? My name's Curtis. I give tours at BGO. Uh -huh. uh, the state butterfly of Arkansas, we only have a picture of it. I know. Can yes. Is there some way we can get it up there? To oh. It catch it? Um, have you been here before? Or not going to be well, here? so. so I mean, you've probably been had more opportunities to look for it than I have since I haven't been here very many years. But, oh, okay. So, so what? My understanding is that is that we don't have any around here now, but it has has been here in the past. And if it's been here in the past, then there's usually a chance we could get it back, uh, right? So, ideally, if you're trying to get something back, you want to plant the host plants and look at what the conditions are for that species. Now, we have a number of other fritillaries, and some years we get really good crops of fritillaries, and some years we don't. Uh, host plants certainly help, 
nectaring, figuring out what they like to nectar upon would also help. I don't know off the top of my head what the Diana fritillary really loves to nectar. I know that you can usually see a bunch of them at Mount Magazine. So I, what I would be inclined to do if I was trying to get Diana up here would be go to the spots where they're common in Mount Magazine, see what plants are there and what habitat is there and see if I could recreate some of it here because then we might get some up here because butterflies fly really long distances and Mount Magazine isn't that far away in the grand scheme of things. We have a lot of fritillaries that come up here. Uh, I would want to check out what the habitat is. I think there are some species that are going to be moving over time as climate changes. So the question becomes, will our habitat here become better for Diana fritillaries or will it become worse? The Diana? Oh, nice. I haven't, I haven't seen it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Is this similar to men are from Mars and women are from Venus? No. There, this is, these are actually really subtle differences between males and females. Uh, in, in, the, in, in these butterflies and, and actually a number of different species of butterflies, there are small differences in what males and females can see. And there, they seem to be, that, that could be under strong selection for a variety of different reasons associated with what type of plant they need to nectar upon, what type of uh, plant is needed for oviposition, so what the females are under selection for to see, what the males are under selection for to see could be different. That can be associated with ornaments too, in this particular example, what we're looking at is, as two, in the, the two sexes of this butterflies are attracted to slightly different things. And they learn preferences a little bit differently. And because of that, I was curious, we were curious in seeing like, what might be the genetic background in, in which we're getting this subtle difference in behavior. So I would say it's, it's uh, like maybe Broadly, it's the same if you want to say that the two sexes are different. They are different. But I don't, I, I think men are from Mars, women are from Venus overemphasizes differences when for the most part, there are a lot of similarities. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to give you a quick time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. So I, I think I probably should end now, but it's been lovely talking with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.